by trauma, that sort of thing. You, you could use a Southwick or otherwise known as a Callahan fusion technique, but it was still about trying to grab a hold of bone with bits of wire. And then some very creative thinking came along trying to adapt other toolkits to potentially uh, using them in the cervical spine. Uh, those look a lot like standard DCP plates, little mini recon plates, um, because that's what they were. Three of the items on that picture were developed in Europe specifically for posterior cervical use, but were never marketed in North America, never passed through the FDA. They're sort of for interest only in North America. So, as I said, you can either have broken posterior elements, you can have posterior elements that have been removed surgically and need to reconstruct the spine. Uh, they can be of poor bone quality, so that the wire or cable just cuts through it like a cheese cutter, and those were some of the problems we struggled with. Then, uh, towards the mid-80s, people started paying attention to what I would call quantitative osteology. People started looking at the vertebra and the cervical spine and the occiput in a way that looked beyond the spinous process or the inferior articular process as a way of grabbing a hold of something. And as that insight was gained, people started realizing there are other ways to grab a hold of vertebra and control them. And then over time, between you know, creative surgeons, creative uh, engineers and biomechanists, we ended up where we are today with some very clever, adaptable technologies. So for the purpose of this talk, we'll look at how we learned to grab a hold of each of the different regions from skull to upper thoracic spine. And uh, we think of it in terms of C1, C2, the occiput, then what I would call the subaxial cervical spine, which is C3 to 6. Those are all very similar vertebra. C7 is its own thing. It's a transitional bit of anatomy that can look like a thoracic vertebra or a subaxial vertebra, just depends on how they were shaped. And then you get to the upper thoracic spine where there are very distinctive uh, differences. So here's C1. Uh, you, you know it uh, and respect it for the position of the spinal cord, the vertebral arteries, and various other structures that are involved in the area surgically. If you've ever done a posterior C1-2 fusion, uh, you can sometimes find out just how frustrating the veins are in that area. Uh, but there are ways to grab a hold of it. This is how it used to be done. On the left-hand side, a so-called galley wiring, but it required sublaminar passage of stainless steel wire. There was a Rogers wiring uh, where you had sublaminar passage wire under both C1 and C2. And you can imagine if there's a cord under there and you don't have much subarachnoid space to work with, um, sometimes you could do more harm than good if you really weren't careful about what you were doing. On the right is a little widget called a Halifax clamp. Um, theoretically, it was a leap forward. Actually, it was really just a pain in the butt to put in. Uh, and it didn't really work very well. It tended to hyperextend the C12 segment. Uh, which is undesirable for a variety of reasons. But that's what was around in the late 80s. In India, Professor Goyle had come up with a way of grabbing a hold of C1 by putting a screw in the articular mass. He was doing that during the 1980s, but it really wasn't known to uh, certainly Western Europe and North America until into the 90s. And when harms published the first paper from Europe with about half a dozen cases. Long before that, Professor Goyle had published a series of about 180 patients with this type of technique. But he understood if you knew about the local anatomy and you could navigate the gap between the vertebral artery on the one hand and the spinal cord on the other, and you could do this, um, this was a very effective way of treating uh, or getting a hold of C1. 
Here's what it looks like in the sagittal plane. You're basically trying to thread this gap. Um, let's see, do I have a laser pointer? Guess not, okay. So that's the C2 nerve root. This is a sinusoidal pattern of veins that sort of envelop the nerve root, which is probably the really joyful part of trying to do this. Um, I've yet to have somebody teach me the way to control those veins other than what Goyle does. And when you see his presentations, you think, wow, that's an amazing exposure, except then you realize he's just ligated both C2 nerve roots and torched the veins. So he has a perfect view of the back. And the patient ends up with some numbness or dysesthesias in their occiput, but in his context uh, in India, he's been doing it for 30 years and it works just fine. Way before that, un largely unknown to us in this part of the world, a general surgeon in Australia published this article about C12 fusions, where he was doing a bilateral uh, screw fixation technique. So you can imagine doing bilateral submastoid dissections, navigating past the vertebral artery and then dropping those two little screws in there like that. Uh, but uh, it works. And this is a case that Dr. Whitesides, our now a retired emeritus partner, did. He shared this slide with me from, I think, probably back in the 1970s, late 70s. <coughs> so then there's C2, which is a, a very unusual vertebra in lots of ways that help us. There's a lot of interest in publications about the anatomy and the, the size and location of the pedicles, the pars region, the thickness of the lamina, the location of the vertebral arteries, and the opportunities for grabbing a hold of C2, taking advantage of all of that. This is that so-called Goyle-Harms C12 fusion technique, which tends to be the more popular way of doing C12 fusions now. Um, I would try to convince you that there's another way that's a lot easier, that's a little older than this. Uh, but this is a very great way to grab a hold of those two elements and control them as you see fit. On the other hand, if you take that PARS screw, adjust the trajectory a little bit, and just drill a little farther, you, you're doing what's known as a mogrel style transarticular fixation. The mogrel method actually predated uh, the, what we think of as the Goyle Harms in Western Europe and North America. But it sort of fell out of favor because people uh, got a little cavalier in the beginning and weren't paying attention to the size and location of the vertebral artery. Uh, basically, we're sort of approaching this with a kind of a cowboy attitude. And unfortunately, there are a number of reported deaths from vertebral artery injuries and stroke. So uh, it, it kind of fell out among the younger surgeons and got sort of replaced by the Goyle Harms concept. But uh, when you do these cases, it's actually a technically easier uh, and faster to do, and you don't have to deal with all the veins around that C2 nerve root. So if you think about what we used to do, this is sort of what you do today. Uh, the grafting is no different. That's a galley graft held in place with a suture, number one vicral, but the, the vicral is passed in exactly the same way as the galley wire. It just holds that graft down against the decorticated surfaces of C1 and 2. But that's the part that makes the operation work, not the screws. Different adaptations of that same concept. You can grab a hold of C2 with PAR screws like you see here, and then get a hold of the rest of the neck in other ways. In this case, this is one of the early plate and screw kind of things. The lamina of C2 is also a, a convenient point of purchase if you need to. The strength is less. Uh, it's a bit more of a fiddle, and you end up with sort of more bulky metal in, in the area where you want to put your bone graft but it's a way of getting yourself out of a tricky problem if the size and location 
<coughs> of the vertebral arteries uh, is really prohibitive for the more standard techniques. It's a case to sort of illustrate the importance of preoperative planning. The 28-year-old female uh, spastic diplegic who's had a progressively severe myelopathy so that she's now completely non-ambulatory. Her left arm basically is functionless and her right arm has diminished in function to the point that she basically can just operate a joystick in her wheelchair. She's also become incontinent. She and her mother were told a few years ago that she needed surgery. For some reason they were spooked off and said, no, I don't want to do that. And now she's almost a quad. Here are her x-rays, and just for the sake of discussion, we'll just say C12 don't look right. And it turns out she has an osodontoidium, which your, the red arrow is indicating, with a high-grade instability. And you can see the degree of upper cervical cord compression, uh, atrophy, and signal intensity change. Supine in the MR scanner, she's relatively reduced, so there's no cord compression, at least lying down. But sitting up in her wheelchair, moving her head and neck around all day long, she's just beating up her cord. So in looking at the anatomy and trying to figure out how to help this person, uh, that's an example of a, an anomalous position of the vertebral artery in such a way that you would not want to put a screw either down the pars or a transarticular method or you would create a big problem. On the other hand, her left hand side anatomy is quite normal. So there are a lot of different ways you could try to help her. In the old days, you'd probably be doing a fusion from the skull down to somewhere in her subaxial spine. But if you can spare movement for somebody who lives in a wheelchair, it's very important for them to be able to move their head and neck around to engage with the world and see where they're going. So the idea for her was to try to do this purely as a C12 fusion. And that's passing a, a guide wire for a transarticular screw on her left side. And then if, if you've pinned slipped caps or fixed uh, valgus impacted hip fractures, you know that you put multiple pins in before you start over drilling them and putting the screw. Okay, so that K wire is transfixing the opposite side. You put in the screw on the left side and then you got to deal with the right side where the anatomy is anomalous. So that's engaging C1 with a articular mass screw and then engaging C2, and you end up with a hybrid construct like that, where you just adapt what you're gonna do to the anatomy that the patient presents with. And then these are CT images. I give myself like about a B or a B minus on that C1 screw. Thankfully, it stayed out of the OC1 joint, but uh, that's the better lucky than good result. <coughs> So that case illustrates making sure you account for what the host needs, what the anatomy does to dictate what your options are, and then hopefully executing what you plan. <clears throat> Looking at the skull, This is an illustration of what we would do for an occipital cervical fusion back in residency. I'll give a shout out to the artist. So this was um, an illustration for a paper that uh, Dr. Bowman published. That's, <clears throat> that's a halo, in case you haven't seen one. But when you did these kinds of things, there really was very little control of, of three-dimensional motion. And so you'd wire bone grafts in like this, put people in halos, and had fusion rates depending on the health and the disease of the patient that might have varied anywhere from about the mid-80s down to maybe 50%. So it was not necessarily a very reliable way of getting things done. Then people started figuring out, okay, well, maybe we can add some rigidity here. So figure out clever ways to use wires to grab a hold of the skull base and uh, the subaxial cervical spine. 
maybe bend a threaded K-wire or a smooth K-wire, kind of lasso it in place. This was sort of all just on the bench in the operating room. And you'd end up trying to solve problems later on with purpose-built loops that were pre-bent because the ones you'd bend yourself had such uh, fatigue points that they'd fairly easily break. Um, you can imagine these might be somewhat resistant to translation, but they're not vertically very stable because wires slide along those rods. They, depending on whether the rods were linked, they might or might not be torsionally stable. Uh, that illustrates what happens, you know, when you try to bend your own in the operating room. Uh, those are concentration points of stress, and you get x-rays like that. If you're really unlucky, the occiput erodes, and you end up with rods in your cerebellum. Not necessarily a good idea. But then along came a little bit of insight into the anatomy of the occiput and understanding the midline keel of bone that exists and how you can grab a hold of, in, of an area that can be anywhere from 10 to 15 millimeters thick of, of very hard cortical bone. And then you quickly realized that screws grab a hold of that a lot better than a little piece of wire passed through a hole. Moving down to the subaxial spine, two sort of intellectual rivals and fierce competitors, Raymond Roycamy and Fritz Magrel, one from France, the other from Switzerland, at about the same time came up with a way of putting a screw in the lateral mass. They were a little different in a starting point and a trajectory, but they were both on to the same idea. If you knew your anatomy well, and Magrel was a professor of anatomy, um, Roy Camille was just a creative guy, um, and so they became rather interesting and intense rivals trying to push this forward. And eventually people in North America started listening, but most of these adaptations came from Europe as an illustration of the difference between the two. Um, and then along the way, uh, some studies were done looking at what could happen if you got it right or you got it wrong. You don't want a nerve root impinged by a screw. You don't want to put screws across facet joints. But if you knew your anatomy, it could work. So then trying to do some of this stuff, people would open up the fracture set, pull out you know, one or another type of plate, figure out a way to adapt those to their purposes. This is taking a standard type of DCP plate and bending it. You can do that, but you can imagine what the stress points are, and if that fusion doesn't heal promptly, you can imagine exactly where that plate's going to break. <coughs> But it worked most of the time. And it worked with a much higher degree of reliability than what you saw originally, just wiring a graft in place and putting people in a halo. This got people out of halos and often got them out of collars, too. Brad Courier gets a lot of credit for doing some of the work that helped move us from you know, home bent plates to purpose-built segmental rod screw devices. And in this study that he published, it was the first opportunity to look at a plate that actually attached to the midline of the occiput. As those products became available, it empowered us to take a case like this with basilar invagination and pretty severe myelopathy and figure out how to put the skull back where it belongs and hold it there with a high degree of reliability resisting movement in three dimensions. We never could have done that using the old methods, particularly things like rods and cables, because basically the skull just settled back down and the rods would slide through the wires. <coughs> These ideas came from all over the world. <coughs> Western Europe, Magarol and Roy Camille, focused on the lateral mass. <coughs> Excuse me. Abumi took a different tack. He was working on learning how to put screws down pedicles in the cervical spine. 
Well, in North America, we were still grappling with the idea of putting screws down pedicles in the lumbar spine, let alone the thoracic area where they're rather large. Um, as a young surgeon in uh, Sapporo, he happened onto this technique and he's actually sort of been the champion worldwide now for 30 years about how to do this. Mechanically, it's a much stronger point of purchase than a lateral mass, probably more than you need for most purposes, but where in this part of the world you'd see your faculty putting screws in the lateral masses, if you're in Japan or the Far East, uh, almost universally they're using cervical pedicle screws, they'll use a lateral mass style screw on occasion when the pedicle's too small. They just see the, the anatomy differently. Frankly, their, their environment for risk tolerance is very different than the United States of attorneys. Um, but what Abumi has taught us is if you need